So it is Saturday the 20th today. I officially move out on Saturday the 27th. I have one full book, part five of Les Mis to read. That's about 250, 270 pages. Can I do it? Let's see. Hello, hello. So it is looking like this is going to be my very last week of vlogging my process of reading Les Mis. We are finally in the homeward stretch. We are at part five. Ah! The reason that I've got a little bit of time pressure in actually finishing this is that I am moving on Saturday and it is currently Wednesday. There are nine books in part five of Les Mis and I'm happy to tell you that I'm currently just starting part five. So that leaves me right now to wrap up books one to four. We start off with book one of part five, which is called The War Within Four Walls. In this book, we are finally at the last push in the barricade. Apologies if you can hear that, my mum is currently vacuuming downstairs. <laughs> so we start off with Andres and the rest of the students back at the barricade. And Victor Hugo kind of gives us a bit of foreshadowing for what we know is going to come with the 1832 rebellion, but also giving us a little bit of history because he has the context of writing in 1860. And having hindsight of knowing that even though the 1832 rebellion was a failure, that that was the precursor to the 1848 rebellions. I think a lot of people tend to look at Les Mis and they ask why on earth did Victor Hugo choose to set his book during this failed rebellion? Why didn't he go for Waterloo? Why didn't he go for 1848? And I think it's really him paying homage to the fact that maybe without these rebellions, the big revolutions that came later would not have happened. That yes, mistakes were made, maybe it was a failure, but it paved the way for the successful attempt. Andres and the rest of the students are currently tidying up the barricade, trying to get as much rest as they can. They're all kind of chatting amongst themselves. One thing that I kind of picked up on here is that at one point, Confer starts talking about Caesar. In fact, he talks about a lot of different historical figures. He's talking about Caesar, he's talking about Cicero, Homer, Shakespeare. Something that it really highlighted to me was the idea that they are talking about rebellion in terms of different theories, in terms of historical people of the past. It's been told like stories rather than actual things and the reality of the situation that they're in has not yet quite sunk in. There's also a really sad foreshadowing moment. Victor Hugo talking about how the students are not quite despondent yet because they have every hope that the people of Paris are going to rise up to help them. Moreover, help was of course going to come they were counting on it. However, it very quickly becomes clear that this is not going to happen and that the French army is going to be there within an hour and is most likely going to kill them all. And Victor Hugo is so great at being able to capture that feeling, that sinking feeling across the students, the way that the atmosphere just drops. These words falling on that buzzing among the groups had the effect of the first raindrop of a storm on a swarm of bees. Everyone fell silent. There was a moment of unutterable quiet in which death might have been heard passing over. You can cut the tension with a knife. At this point, realising that it's going to be a hopeless case, Andres turns to the people at the barricade and says, basically, anybody who has families needs to leave. That it's all well and good trying to fight for principles, but who's going to suffer at their deaths? And there's a very extended passage in which Andres and Marius and Confer are appealing to the different fathers. You get yourself killed, then you're dead. Fine. And tomorrow? Young girls with nothing to eat. That's terrible. You wanted to deliver the people from royalty. You hand your young girls over to the police. Friends beware, have compassion. My friends, there is a tomorrow. You won't be there for that tomorrow, but your families will and the suffering. It's a lot of repetition of the same thing, concluding with, we know that you feel you've been chosen to die usefully and magnificently, and that each one of you is determined to have his share of the glory. Good for you, but you're not alone in this world. There are others you have to think of. You must not be selfish. And it basically gets to the point where there were five men who definitely qualify as people who have families and need to leave the barricade. However, in order to leave the barricade, they have to dress up like French army men. The problem is, is that there are only four uniforms. So they all end up going around the group, trying to decide which of the five men is going to end up having to sacrifice himself. When suddenly out of nowhere, a fifth uniform is dropped from the sky. And we discover that Jean Valjean has entered the barricade and that it is he who has dropped that final uniform, saving the man. Because of Jean Valjean, five, not four men, are going to be saved from the barricade. After the five men leave, Andres takes it upon himself to kind of pep up the students, reminding them that even though they know that they are most certainly going to die, that they are going to pave the way for revolution to come later. And there was a really somber moment, at least for me, when I was reading that, when Andres is so optimistic about what the future holds, and he says, citizens, the 19th century is a great century. 
But the 20th century will be a happy one. Nothing like the history of old, not anymore. There'll be no reason then to fear as we do today. Conquest, invasion, usurpation, rivalry between armed nations, civilization interrupted by a marriage of kings, a birth within the hereditary tyrannies, a partition of peoples by Congress, dismemberment brought about by the collapse of a dynasty, a conflict between two religions coming up against each other. And obviously Victor Hugo is writing in the 19th century. He has no idea of what's going to come in the 20th century, but reading this as a modern reader, I'm like, oh god no. Apologies, I'm gonna have to put my light on. Oh god, that's very bright. Um, we maybe don't need that. Uh. Is that normal? <laughs> This camera is actually really good at colour correcting itself so that I don't need as much of my ring light anymore. <laughs> it's becoming very clear at this point that the French army is making its way to the barricade and once again the tension is so palpable. Nothing could be seen but something could be heard. There was at a certain distance some mysterious movement going on. It was obvious the critical moment was approaching and it's at that moment that the fighting breaks out. We also see as Gavroche re-enters the barricade and Marius is devastated because one of his intentions of sending Gavroche to Cosette's house was in order to give a letter to Cosette but also to save Gavroche. Jean Valjean also proves useful through the second fight as he's able to restore the barricade after a piece of it falls down. Using his strength he's able to prop a mattress up so that gunfire isn't able to break through and this act gives the students more time. Though the students do start to notice how Jean Valjean never kills anybody, he never uses his gun in order to kill. Later on it's becoming very obvious that supplies are depleting. Not only do the students have no food but they're starting to run out of ammunition and unfortunately Gavroche hears about this and Gavroche takes it upon himself to go over the barricade and pick up ammunition from the fallen soldiers. And this was the point where I wanted to cry. <laughs> Gavroche is basically singing and joking and dancing his way as he tries to pickpocket all of the soldiers who have fallen and get bullets for the barricade. However, of course, the French army are not going to spare this young child and they start shooting at him and Gavroche takes it as a big joke. I'll be blowed, exclaimed Gavroche. Someone's trying to kill my corpses. And I'm like, Gavroche, this is not the time for jokes right now. It was a dreadful and enchanting spectacle. Gavroche, under fire, was teasing the rifles. He seemed to be enjoying himself tremendously. Here was the sparrow pecking at the bird hunters. However, this does not last long and unfortunately, two bullets end up hitting Gavroche and killing him and I'm like, the students rush out from the barricade to pick up Gavroche's body but unfortunately they are too late and he is dead and he has died without being able to provide them the ammunition that they need. At one point Angerus starts to address Javert who if you've forgotten has actually been taken prisoner by the students and Jean Valjean notices Javert and strikes a deal with Angerus asking that due to the service Jean Valjean offered in being able to protect the barricade that he should be the one to dispatch Javert. Angerus asks no questions about this and says yes this man belongs to you you can shoot him. Jean Valjean takes Javert to another street and Javert thinks okay this is my time Jean Valjean is going to kill me. Jean Valjean thrusts the pistol under his arm and fixed on Javert a look that needed no words to say Javert it is I. Javert replied take your revenge. Jean Valjean drew a knife from his pocket and opened it. A blade exclaimed Javert you're right it suits you better. Jean Valjean cut the martingale Javert had around his neck. Then he cut the cords around his wrists then stooping down he cut the string with which his feet were tied and straightening up he said you're free. Javert was not easily surprised, but for all his self-control, he could not help giving a start. He remained dumbfounded and motionless. Jean Valjean then proceeds to give Javert his address, saying that if he makes it out alive, which he doubts that he will, then he lives at Rue de l'Homme Armé. And Javert does not know what to make of this, but Jean Valjean is able to convince Javert to get away, but still aiming his pistol and shooting at air to make it look as if he has killed Javert. And it's at this point that Marius asks the question of who was that man that Jean Valjean has just taken out. And Angerus replies Javert. And we're reminded at this point that Marius and Javert actually had some sort of relationship because he he was the inspector that he went to in order to report to Nadier. Victor Hugo ends this chapter saying, a sinister chill went through Marius's heart. Okay, we're getting much too dark in here. Ah, there's still so much of this book left to do. <laughs> And at this point, this is the final push. And as we get to chapter 21 of this particular book, which is named Heroes, we have now reached the final attack. Victor Hugo describes this final attack from the French army as being like a hurricane. Bullets are now just pouring into the barricade. Jean Valjean keeps out of the fighting. Meanwhile, Marius doesn't care. He was offering himself as a target. He feels like he has nothing left to live for. And as the fighting continues and as the different students start to fall, Victor Hugo describes, these men became titans. And one by one, very quickly, the students fall. 
Fui was killed, Korfrak was killed, stabbed in the chest three times with a baronet as he helped a wounded soldier, Confair had time only to look skywards and then died. We see that Marius is still fighting but he's been wounded many times. And then we finally hit upon Onjaras who has gotten to this point of the fight unscathed. And there's an entire page where Victor Hugo describes him as looking like a Greek god, or at the very least a Greek hero. Finally Marius does start to pass out from his injuries and he feels himself being lifted and starts to think to himself, I'm being taken prisoner, I'm going to be held hostage. The French soldiers finally catch up with Anjouras and they recognise him as the leader of the rebellion. But Anjouras is completely unfazed by this and he just says, go ahead and shoot me. And Victor Hugo reinforces that Anjouras has not got a scratch on him. He looks so beautiful even in the midst of death. A national guardsman who had taken aim at Anjouras lowered his gun saying, I feel as if I'm going to be shooting a flower. However, we quickly discover that Anjouras is not the only student left standing. Grunter, who had passed out the night before from drunkenness, emerges. He wakes up from his stupor. He stands up, he sees the carnage, he walks over to Anjouras and says, long live the Republic. He turns to Anjouras and he says, with your permission? Basically asking him for permission to die standing next to him. Anjouras takes his hand and smiles. And literally a second later, they are both shot dead. <sighs> It doesn't get easier. I'm glad I've done this with like two days removed from actually reading it because I was really sad. This is the end of the rebellion. It's failed. The students are all dead. I'm just going to insert this meme here that I've seen a lot of times about lemurs and <laughs> It holds true. And we end book one with finding out that Jean Valjean was actually the person who captured Marius, that he is taking him to safety, but we don't know how. Moving us swiftly on to book four, The Bowels of Leviathan, in which we finally hit upon the infamous sewer section of Lamers. There are two main big digressions that you'll often hear about when it comes to Lamers. Firstly, Waterloo, but secondly, the sewers, in which Victor Hugo basically goes on a rant about this Paris sewage system. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> I will just say I do feel like this is a lot more relevant to the plot and it's not as long as I remember it being. He's basically talking about the good that an effective sewage system will do for a country. However, Paris's current sewage system is no good. And I, I, I yeah, I don't have much to say about it. <laughs> you get some interesting history and I don't think it's as bad as the convent section, but I also <laughs> I'm like, okay, what do I do with this? I'm just going to move us on to book three, which is The Maya Yet the Soul. And here we find out that these sewers that Victor Hugo has been so eloquently describing is where Jean Valjean has taken Marius. And we see how Jean Valjean is just completely disoriented by this experience, dropping himself down into the sewers and being met by pitch black, obviously the foul smell, and just not quite knowing where he is within Paris. Victor Hugo describes Jean Valjean had fallen from one circle of hell into another, that even though he feels safe from the soldiers, like, it, he doesn't know where he is. And it becomes clear very quickly that the police have guessed that some people will be seeking refuge in the sewers. So as Jean Valjean makes his way with Marius on his back, he realises that he's not alone. However, he thankfully is able to see the police patrol and they aren't able to see him, so he's able to very quickly hide. And it really hits you how it's all just chance that he doesn't get caught. And you can just feel the agony and the exhaust of Jean Valjean. And this is a very, very strong man who is just completely fatigued by this experience of having to drag an, a fully grown man through a sewer and just the panic that it's all going to be for nothing, that they're either going to die down there of exhaustion or Marius's wounds are going to get infected and he's going to die before Jean Valjean can take him home. And quite frankly, how Marius does survive this, I have no idea. And once again, we see Jean Valjean's love for Cosette as Victor Hugo notes. Of whom was he thinking in his deep despondency? Neither of himself nor of Marius. He was thinking of Cosette. <laughs> Anybody who says that Cosette is not an important character of Flame is, I, 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 I want to have words with you. She is the most important character in Lamers, I will have you know. And as I said, Jean Valjean was not alone in the sewers. Not only were there police patrols there, but we also find Tenardier, who has dropped into the sewers to pickpocket from any dead men that he finds. However, he doesn't recognise Jean Valjean and he seems strangely willing to help him, mistaking Marius on his back as a dead man that Jean Valjean has killed. And he basically offers him his way out of the sewers for 50% of whatever Jean Valjean stole from Marius before he died. Jean Valjean is not able to give him much money but still, Thenardier seems to want to help him. Thenardier unlocks the gate to the sewer and Jean Valjean and Marius are finally able to breathe. They're back in the open air. And just as you could feel the despair of Jean Valjean in the sewer, now you can feel the delight and joy that he is going to survive. The sky offered itself on all sides as a vast calm. The river came up to his feet with the sound of a kiss. However, we very quickly realise why it was that Thenardier was so keen to help a stranger in the sewer. And that's because the first person that Jean Valjean meets as he exits the sewer is... Javert. And of course, 
suggests that grating so obligingly open for Jean Valjean was an act of cunning on Thenardier's part. Once again, you're really building up the sense of Thenardier as somebody who never does anything for anybody else's interest, only for himself. And Javert doesn't even recognise Jean Valjean at first. And Jean Valjean basically gives himself up being like, well, I did say he could catch me when I was out of this, so eh. But Jean Valjean turns to Javert and says, listen, I understand you can take me, you can do whatever you want with me, but please let me deliver Marius back to his grandfather. Let me make sure that he is safe first. And really without questioning, Javert lets him do that. Which is just a complete surprise to Jean Valjean. He thought he was going to be questioned much more or denied outright. Once Marius is delivered to his grandfather's house, Jean Valjean then turns to Javert and says, can I ask another favour? Javert says yes, and then Jean Valjean asks if he may be permitted to go back home just for five minutes to say goodbye to his family. And amazingly, Javert grants this request. Jean Valjean is dropped off at his home. He quickly goes in and is about to step back outside when he discovers that Javert's carriage has disappeared. Javert is no longer there. Also towards the end of this book we see Monsieur Guinamand and his reaction to Marius being back home. But when Marius arrives at his grandfather's house everybody thinks that he has died and we finally see Monsieur Guinamand break down. He's just horrified at the idea that his grandson has died without them being able to make amends. And then the absolute joy at Marius waking up and recognising his grandfather. And finally, finally, Monsieur Guinamand is able to express to Marius how much Marius means to him and how much he loves him. And he's so overcome by this emotion that he ends the chapter fainting. Which then leads us on finally for this particular portion of the vlog into me talking about book four, Javert Derailed. And I have to say, I think this might count as my favourite chapter of Les Mis. It's really really tight, it's between this and the Javert triumphant chapter from part one. I guess I have to conclude that Javert must be my favourite character because my favourite chapters in Les Mis are ones about him and his psychology. Basically this is just a short little book in which we see Javert just completely at sea. His interactions with Jean Valjean in the last 24 hours we see have completely upended his life. There's such parallels between Jean Valjean's initial epiphany at the beginning of the book to Javert and his epiphany here. A change, a revolution, a catastrophe had occurred deep down inside him and there was cause for self-examination. Javert was suffering horribly. Several hours ago Javert had ceased to be a simple man. He felt troubled. That mind, so limpid in its blindness, had lost its transparency. There was a cloudiness in that crystal. And it's basically him questioning now, what does he do? Does he follow his conscience or does he follow his duty? Because everything in his life up until this moment has told him that his duty is to arrest Jean Valjean and to take him prisoner. But now his conscience is jumping out and saying, no, you can't possibly do that. That is not right. Jean Valjean saved his life and has proven time and time again that he is a good person. But according to the law, Jean Valjean should be arrested because he is an escaped convict, he broke his parole. And Javert just cannot reconcile that. And there are times within this chapter, like the first uh, Javert triumphant chapter, where you can see that Victor Hugo is clearly teasing Javert so much for his rigidity. You know, saying that he had ceased to be a simple man. Later saying, is there anything in the world other than tribunals, sentences that have to be carried out, the police and the authorities? You know, he's clearly having a lot of fun, but he's also taking seriously the fact that Javert is just he doesn't know what to do here with himself. And once again, there's so much animal imagery in this section. He's compared to a wolf recapturing its prey, the legal tiger. Javert is admitting to himself that Jean Valjean had every right to kill him at the barricade, and yet he didn't. And in many ways that it would have been so much easier if Jean Valjean had killed him, because then he wouldn't be so uncertain. It's also during this chapter that I realise how fantastic the songwriters of Les Mis were at being able to capture, you know, multiple pages into one, like, two, three minute song. Through this particular section I could see so many instances where song lyrics came from these exact words. To be of granite and to doubt, to be the statue of retribution, cast all of a piece in the mould of the law and suddenly to realise that beneath your torso of bronze you have something absurd and unruly that is almost like a heart. You can see references to that in the line my heart is stone and still it trembles which is one of my favourite lines in that song. <laughs> As we get to the end of this chapter we realise that Javert just cannot reconcile these two opposing viewpoints, his duty or his conscience. He goes to the police station and he writes out a letter. He writes out a letter to the service detailing lots of different changes that the police can make in order to make things better and also to make things in some ways kinder to prisoners. He then makes his way to the River Seine. Javert bent his head and looked down. All was black. Nothing was distinguishable. He puts his hat down on the bridge and then throws himself into the river, killing himself. For a few minutes Javert remained motionless, watching this tenebrous orifice. He gazed on the invisible with a seemingly attentive fixity. There was the sound of rushing waters. Abruptly he took off his hat and placed it on the edge of the embankment. A moment later a tall black figure, which from a distance some tardy passerby might have taken for a phantom, appeared standing on the parapet, leaned over the Seine, then straightened up again and dropped into the blackness below.
there was a heavy splash, and the shadows alone were privy to the convulsions of that mysterious figure after it had disappeared into the water. <laughs> so one of our main characters who has been with us in this story since part one is no more. And I just get emotional every time I read it. It's just such a fantastic book. It really is my favourite section in all of Flame is. I just find the exploration of Javert's psychology is so interesting and so well written. I um, I love this book guys, I love this book. So hopefully before I end up moving I can finally crack through the last few books of Les Mis. Oh! I will meet you and we'll be talking about part five.